Now with a brave run up field. Here's Akers. No. With a chance. Open net. Deep goal. A silent trigger. The team that broke barriers to transform a sport. As the 1990s began, it looked like it would be a revolutionary time for women. The 80s had been a monumental decade full of diverse female pioneers. Women began gaining more independence, pursuing education and jobs rather than marrying and having children. They were breaking barriers in both entertainment and politics. Women's suffrage has been going on for many years, but the truth is, a major part of the feminist movement began in 1991 when the U.S. Women's National Team showed the world that they could accomplish just as much as any man. Although it was only a sport, this victory commenced gender equality and established a foundation for all female athletes to build off of in the future. Despite the many barriers the U.S. Women's National Team faced, they persevered to win the Women's World Cup in November 1991 in China. Through their victory, they gained respect for female athletes by struggling through gender inequality, contributed to the gaining momentum in the feminist movement, and pioneered the way for all of women's soccer in the future. As World War II progressed, and most men were off fighting in the war, women took up their jobs as well as their hobbies, including soccer. As time went on, the women's game began expanding, and even though it wasn't culturally accepted yet, teams were forming. It wasn't long until the women started showing their talent on the pitch, and soccer was available in most high schools and colleges. And it just so happened that soccer came to my neighborhood. No one in my family ever knew soccer. They didn't understand the rules. They didn't know how it was played, but they signed me up anyway, and I fell in love with it, and it became something that my family did together. The women's game evolved due to the Title IX Act signed by President Richard Nixon in 1972. The law prohibited sex discrimination in all aspects of educational programs. During the 1980s, women's soccer was becoming more popular. The U.S. Soccer Association decided to form a women's team of their own, so they hired Mike Ryan to be the coach. In 1985, the U.S. team participated in the Mundolito, Spanish for Little World Cup. After the team lost three games and tied two, Mike Ryan was fired and University of North Carolina coach Anson Dorrance was hired to coach the team at the 1988 FIFA Women's Invitational. And initially that was supposed to be the first world championship and for some reason, I'm not sure exactly why it fell through or FIFA decided not to accredit it, so it was sort of the, the practice plan for the next opportunity. On November 16, 1991, the opening ceremony of the World Cup was held in Guangzhou, Guangdong Province. The ceremony highlighted the Chinese culture and inaugurated the first Women's World Cup. The U.S. team, a group of young women ages 19 to 27, had been winning their games consecutively. They had won all three of their games in Group B and had even beat Chinese Taipei 7-0 in the quarterfinals. Despite these victories on the field, the U.S. team was faced with much gender discrimination. But way back then, you, you were made to feel like you didn't deserve being treated equally. You're like, oh, thank you so much for your hand-me-downs. So our training jerseys were men's XL, t-shirts that were had already been worn and had the pit stains in them and everything. Our bus, our dilapidated bus, had a, it was packed with luggage and it was a full women's national team. Flying home took 52 hours because we had to go the cheapest way all around the globe and drop off every team. The team was also faced with third class travel cheap hotels, and bad food. The final match of the Women's World Cup was held on November 30th, 1991. The two teams competing were Norway and USA. The match was held at the Guangzhou Tianhe Stadium in front of nearly 65,000 people. 
Only 20 minutes into the game, USA's star player Michelle Aker scored off a free kick by Shannon Higgins, putting them in the lead. But only 8 minutes later, the Norwegians fired back with a header goal to tie the match. The game looked like it was going into overtime when Akers intercepted a pass from defending opponent Tina Svensson back to Norway goalkeeper Raiden Seth. Akers had an open goal in front of her. She scores, putting the U.S. in the lead with only minutes to spare. Finally, the whistle blows and the USA are the champions. We were all lulled into this feeling of, it's going to be like this when we get home. You know, we're going to change soccer in America. People are now going to pay attention. However, it was quite a shock when they arrived back in America. Four people met our plane when we arrived at JFK, says Michelle Akers, two reporters, the coach of the men's national team, and a friend of mine. Nobody knew about the World Cup because of lack of global media coverage available from China. The only coverage was a couple of newspaper columns, making the buzz around the first Women's World Cup virtually non-existent. However, after time, word spread from the few that did know and care, inspiring mainly young female fans. The U.S. team was invited to communities, asked to bring their medals, and hold soccer clinics. The first Women's World Cup broke many barriers in history. The event itself was monumental because it brought to light countless gender stereotypes and broke many barriers. The World Cup shifted people's expectations of women in sports and also expelled social standards held for women at this time. In the 1980s, there were very few famous female athletes and females in team sports were nearly unheard of. The 1991 World Cup was the first women's soccer championship ever held and it showed people all around the world that women could compete in high-level sports competitions. In addition, this event marked the first time that three female referees were hired to officiate. The competition went down in history books and triggered more opportunities for female athletes. After losing in 1995, the U.S. team dominated the 1999 World Cup and became champions for the second time. This was the event that put women's soccer on the map. Currently, the U.S. is the number one team in the world, all because of the 1991 World Cup. The success of the World Cup initiated the ongoing phenomenon of women's soccer by proving that a women's World Cup was feasible and successful. This allowed FIFA to hold a World Cup every four years and later led to women's soccer being added to the Olympic Games. This was important for the U.S. because by winning the first World Cup, they established their dominance and had an opportunity to kickstart their women's soccer program, which is why they have such a great program today. The 1991 U.S. team also had effect on a global scale. One of the world's greatest male soccer stars, Pele, was inspired by U.S.'s Michelle Akers to spend money on a women's soccer program in Brazil. The 1991 World Cup began the fight against gender inequality in sports, a battle that has since been continued by female athletes all over the world. And the advocating that the U.S. team did in 1991 has carried on to the present team. The barrier of unequal pay is finally being broken by the current national team and their vocalization on the topic. The team has recently filed a lawsuit against the U.S. Soccer Association for the unfairness of men getting much higher salary than women. All of this began many years ago when the first women's national team when they first began advocating in 1991. The World Cup may not have been very well known, but it sparked much more than we'll ever know. Most importantly, this team inspired a whole new generation of girls. The team's legacy lives on in a new generation of young female soccer players. The revolution they caused transformed a sport and united the nation.